Let's stand. I want you to turn your Bible, and we're going to do it this morning. We're going to read it together. And I'm, I'm going to read from the King James Version, so, or the New King James, let me say that. Um, so if it's a little different than yours, it will be all right, I guess. But I want to read it together because I want to make kind of a little bit of a decorate, de declaration, if I can get it out some more, tongue-tied. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, it seems like now that all of us, it seems like everybody I talk to has just got stuff going on, challenges. And, and sometimes you can grow weary in that. And you almost feel like, I know my nature is to, when stuff is happening, to try to take it and make a decision or do what needs to be done to correct it. And, and sometimes we just have to learn to, that God is in control. And that we just have to sometimes look to the Lord and be reminded of who he is and what he does. And this, to me, this, the, uh, this is kind of a verse that uh, I think we can say together and remind ourselves that God is our rock. He is our fortress. And he is our deliverer. And we can trust him in that. Let's read together. Uh, starting in verse 1. Well, I'm going to read verse 1 and 3. I'm sorry. Psalms 18. We'll get it. I get all carried away and can't give you the one through three. Psalms 18, verses one through three. And I want you to speak this. Speak it over your life. Speak it over your situations. Are you ready? One, two, three. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Somebody say amen. Can we do it one more time? <laughs> Declare this over your life. Let's do one, two, three. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Praise God. Somebody give God a hand clap. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. There, Joy. <clears throat> so the Lord took me in a little different direction this week. Um, actually, yesterday, of where I thought I was going to go. But I want to talk to you this morning because of seeing all so many Christians, including myself, you know, facing the battles, going through difficult times and seasons. Uh, but I want to talk to you about living a victorious life. And I don't know how many of you feel like your life is that victorious right now. Sometimes I don't think mine is very victorious. But I think, again, it, de it depends upon your definition. Thank God that one of the things that God has been dealing with me on is getting a clear-cut definition of what I'm talking about sometimes. When you think about a victorious life, what do you think about? I think for many people, you know, you think about freedom. You know, just the, the ability to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it. And, and just, you know, in America, we live in the land of the free. And we honor that and we celebrate that because we like our personal independence and the ability to make our own decisions and to choose our own path in life. That's what most of us, I think, when we think about freedom, would think about. We, we can do whatever we want to do. But the, unfortunately... This is not what freedom in Christ is. <clears throat> freedom in Christ is not getting to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. 
So it's a little different. It's a little different approach. But Jesus has set us free. We know the scripture. But he didn't set us free to do whatever we want to do. He set us free to walk with him in relationship. We're free to come into the presence of God if you're born again. To enter into the Holy of Holies, to worship Him, to walk with Him, to talk with Him, to be, to have a face to face communication with the Creator of the universe. That's freedom. He wanted us not only to be in relationship with Him and to be kind, but to be also the kind of people that He created us to be. He has given us the freedom and he's also given us the power to obey God and to choose his will for our lives. His will for our lives, not our will for our lives. That's freedom in Christ, that he give us the ability to choose his will for our lives. The, dis the choice we have is do you choose or what do you choose? In order to live a Christian, I would say, victorious life, we got to first recognize that we are in need of a Savior. We have to understand that we aren't it. And it's not about us. It's not my desire. It's not what I want. It's not what I want to do. But we are in need of a Savior because without Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that we have no hope. No hope. And that we're without God in this world. Without Jesus. No hope without God. Even though we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible tells us that. God has a perfect plan and it involves us. That's an amazing thing. That God wants to involve every one of us, every one of his people, all across the world in his plan. The problem is, with that, is that God is holy. He's holy. And he cannot tolerate the pres uh, sin in his presence. He can't be around it. He won't be around it. And unless he cleanses us, from our sin and all unrighteousness, it's impossible for him to work with us and through us for his eternal purpose. We have to be born again in order to be used of God for his purpose. To where he can, and because he's not going to be in the presence of sin. So God's solution to the problem, this was a big problem because there was nothing we could do. We were hopeless. We couldn't do anything to correct the divide that had happened, to, to remove the sin in our life. So God's solution to the problem was to offer a perfect sacrifice once and for all that would cleanse and wash the sin of the world. Everyone that would re, uh, receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and be reconciled back to him. It allows us this washing, the blood of Jesus. And when we give our hearts and life to the Lord, it allows us to enter into the presence of God because without it, we cannot enter into the presence of God. He did this with his son, with Jesus, who shed his blood for the remission of sin upon the cross of Calvary. This freedom from sin, not only Jesus can give, but it allows us to offer ourselves, this is freedom too, as slaves to the Lord. What he's given you the opportunity to do by washing you, by dying on the cross, and by forgiving your sin is not to give you a, a, a clear thing to do whatever you want to do, but he's given you the choice and the opportunity to die. <laughs> That doesn't sound like freedom much, does it? To offer ourselves as a slave to the Lord who continues to work in us to make us more and more like him. The Bible tells us no one is free. You think, now wait a minute. 
The Bible tells us that we're all slaves. In Romans chapter 6, if you want to turn there, you can. Verses 16 through 18. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. I really want you to grasp something this morning. I, this, is, this isn't something we don't know. But again, I feel like the Lord is just reminding us. Sometimes it's easy just to get in, you know, in life and in even the Christian life, even in your church. And just really, I'm learning, I almost feel like more and more that the Lord just wants us focusing on the basics and the foundation and the, um, just the, the solid, just, I don't know how to even say it, but just quit worrying about so many things and just focus on the foundational things. But listen to this, Romans chapter 6, read along with me in 16 through 18. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? Now, that's not saying you just necessarily give yourself, you know, to be a slave to Satan or whatever. But it's, it's, it's whoever you present yourself, whatever you choose to go, whichever path you choose to go, you are presenting yourself as a, as a slave to obey. You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death. If you choose sin, you're a slave to sin. Or of obedience leading to righteousness. If you choose obedience to, to, to the Lord, then the Lord becomes your owner. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, which we all were at one time, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, in other words, faith in God's word. You believed by faith in the word of God to which you were delivered and having be, been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness, in other words, to God. Having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. Paul made it clear that we're either slaves to sin or we're slaves to righteousness. For many, this is difficult because our flesh does not want to submit to anybody or anything. We want to be our own ruler. We want to be our own God. When we think about slavery, you know, it brings negative connotations because we've seen the negative part of slavery in, in the worldly sense. We think about hardship, brutality, inequality, being less than other people without the opportunities that others have. But the true freedom of a slave of Christ is one that can experience joy and peace because of their total surrender to the Lord God and to his authority. And one that experiences the goodness and the sovereignty of Christ in their life. So the freedom in Christ Jesus is one that you can rest assured that he's in control. We just submit our life to him and his authority and his headship. And we do what he tells us to do because we know he's looking out for our best interest. He's taking care of us. He's making a way. And uh, so there's total freedom. We get to experience in that surrender the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. Even though it seems like a contradiction. The only true freedom in Christ Come to those that are his slaves. To those that have been bought and no longer their own. We must understand that it is Jesus that sets us free. And unless he pays the price for our freedom, we will remain a slave to our sin because we have nothing to offer the Lord. We have nothing to pay for the, the payment of our sin and that, and that could bring us back into right standing and, and into the presence of the Lord. There's nothing we can do on our own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 tells us that you are no longer your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, 
which are God's. They belong. Our body, our spirit belongs to the Lord. The price that Jesus paid when he bought us was his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. So Christians have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ and we are his possession. We're not a hireling. He didn't just choose us to, and say, if you'll do this, I'll pay you that. He owns us. We have nothing. We, uh, we have no say-so. He is our God. He is our King. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. If the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Why then is it that so many Christians seem to live their life still as a slave to sin? I just listed a few probably. Number one is a Christian even though we have been set free from the bondage of sin, it's been paid for. We have been washed. We have been cleansed. We oftentimes will put the chains of bondage back on ourselves because our flesh still enjoys the old life. See, that's what we got to, I, I feel like so strong that we got to begin to man up and admit the problem is sin and the problem's in me. It's hard sometimes to admit that, that I'm the problem. But the problem that sometimes we end up back in places into bondage is because we enjoyed that so God set us free from that. He said that you don't have to deal with that anymore. But we keep sliding back over here because we enjoy it. We like it. And then we end right back in bondage when we shouldn't have had to even be there to begin with. So we got to repent before the Lord, submit ourselves to his leadership and his headship, and resist the lure and the temptation of sin. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, turn there, let's turn there, to put off the old self. That means take it off. And who takes it off? You do. Take off the old self with its deceit and its corruption and put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And he goes on to say, put off lying and put on truthfulness. Take off stealing and put on usefulness and work. Take off bitterness, rage, and anger, and put on kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. See, we do have some responsibility, even though God has paid the price. God has cleansed us from this. We still have, we still, there's this process of the renewing of the mind and some responsibilities that we have in order to deal with the sin that we're all facing. How do we put on the new man? By continually feeding ourselves on the word of God, by prayer, and by honoring the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. It's by the word of God. It's by prayer and the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, that we attain the power to escape the desire to go back to the old life of sin. Number two, many times... We live as though we were slaves to sin because we fail to understand that we've been crucified with Christ and the old man is dead. Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul declares that I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer the old man who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith and the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. So the victorious Christian life is one of death to self, 
of being raised up by the power of Almighty God to walk in newness of life and one of total submission to Jesus Christ. That's a victorious Christian life. Our thoughts should constantly be about Jesus. That's where our drive and force should be, is to be about Jesus, the one that saved us. Not thoughts about this dead flesh and sin and the devil, that, but because it's been crucified with Christ. To live the victorious life, we need to get our thoughts off of the worldly things and get our minds on things above the Bible, tells, on the heavenly things. Number three, many still live as though they are slaves to sin because they've not yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit as a gift so we can be victorious in our lives. Galatians 5 verse 16 tells us to walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All believers possess the Holy Spirit. But the scriptures tell us that we need to walk in the Spirit and we need to yield to His control. So what this is saying is that we should choose to follow the Holy Spirit's prodding in our lives rather than following the prodding of our flesh. By surrendering our life to the Holy Spirit, He will help us grow in our faith and, and help us even to fall in love with Jesus in a more deeper way every day of our life. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to res resist sin and not give in to the temptation, but to live according to the Word of God. As we surrender ourselves to Jesus, we will grow and we will mature in our faith by reading and studying God's Word and by prayer, and we will find ourselves more and more and more able to stand in the power of the Holy Spirit and resist sin. Another important point I want to make is that the key to victory over sin is not found within us. I mean, let me say, you know, Holy Spirit's within, I'm not saying, but in our own ability, in our own strength. But it's found in God and his faithfulness to us. So let me say it again. The key to victory over sin, I don't have the, I'm not capable of dealing with the sin in my life. God is the one that will deliver me from sin. It's his faithfulness. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 tells us that if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I believe the problem that a lot of Christians have is that we will not confess or even admit that, it, that sin is the problem. And it's so hard for us to admit that we're the problem, that we're the one that's responsible for the sin. We want to blame it on, well, my dad did this, my mom did that, my brother, my sister, my church did. But sin is the problem, and we're responsible for it. We want to blame it on someone else or something else instead of owning our sin. Psalms 145 verse 18 says, The Lord is near to all who will call upon him, to all who will call upon him, in truth. So, I mean, to ask God to, you know, to deliver me when I'm not admitting that I'm even a sinner, I think you got to come before the Lord and be transparent. You got to come in truth and reveal, God, I'm a sinner. I need help. Forgive me, Lord, and, and help me deal with this situation that I'm struggling in. We have to come to the Lord in truth and ask. Our key to victory over sin lies in the promise of God himself who declared, listen to this, we need to be reminded of this again this morning. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, 
but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now we're talking about Christians here, right? If you're a Christian, you will not be tempted beyond your ability to endure it. God will give you a way out, but you may have to stand up and admit it and, and take, you know, and step into the direction that God tells you to go in. So the key to a victorious life is that it's lived by faith and in total surrender to God. It's make, willingly making yourself a slave to God. The victorious life is to triumph over everything in this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This life is to conquer fear by knowing God's peace. It's a slap to the devil when he's trying to fill us with fear and we, we stand up and say, you know what? We're going to walk in peace because I know what the Lord said. I know what, he's, I know what his word is. And we're just going to walk in peace through this situation. It is to preserve, per persevere through trouble teaching us to be more than conquerors through Christ who loves us and to properly deal with temptation when it comes our way. The devil will work. The devil will tempt. The devil will lure. But the Bible makes it clear as a, as a, as a believer, it will not be beyond your control. He, he will make a way for you to escape it. So the life the Christian life, the victorious life, is also lived with your eyes set on things above, not on things of this world. I think we've got to get our eyes sometimes. You know, we, we have such a tendency. I love in the Bible, uh, I think it, I can't remember what story it was, but when they say, look up. Some of us just sometimes, we get so focused on what's going on and the dailies and the troubles and the mess and the that we're so focused that all we're doing is looking down and Jesus said lift up your head look at the bigger picture there's more going on here than just this stuff God's got a plan and it's going forward and we're a part of it the victorious Christian life is one who lives in the reality that his eternal life is set securely in Jesus Christ. Get that. We need to know that. Our eternal security as a Christian is set in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us, I don't know, I didn't, just came, God just brought it, Holy Spirit, but what is it? No, no one can be taken out of the hand of God. I don't know how to say it. I don't know exactly how to say it. God has us as Christians. You cannot be taken out. He has us. And we're secure in Him. 